Many years ago, you wrote an article that was entitled Beyond Hope. And I'm just going to um, read one line. Hope is really nothing more than a secular way of keeping us in line. So what are your thoughts on the relationship between hope and denial? Well, um, I've taken a lot of flack for that article, especially by a lot of people who didn't read it very carefully that in that article, I mean, there are so many people who say we have to have hope in order to take action. And that's not the point. The point is to actually define hope. And I was doing a talk 10, 12, 13 years ago in Colorado, and I'm bashing hope, and then somebody in the audience shouts out, what's your definition of hope? I don't know. And so I asked the audience, what's your definition of hope? And they came up with a great definition, which is hope is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. Mm -hmm. And that's how we use it in everyday language. Um, you don't normally say, I hope I'm going to eat dinner tonight, if you're, unless you're starving. I mean, in normal circumstances, you don't say, I hope I'm going to eat dinner, you just do it. And you don't say, um, you know, I hope that I don't know, I hope I go to sleep tonight, unless you're an insomniac. An insomniac would say it because it's out of their control. Mm -hmm. But a normal person, you just, you just go to sleep. And so, on the other hand, the next time I get on a plane, I hope it doesn't crash. Um, do you know how to get where you're going tonight? I, I, I mean, you've I, been there before? I have been there before. Okay, so let's presume you really know how to get there. You're not going to say, I hope I don't get lost, because you're just going to drive there. On the other hand, you could, and you're also probably not going to say, I hope I don't run out of gas, because you can just fill your tank with gas. Uh, you, could, you could easily say, I hope I don't get in an accident, because somebody else could, you know, do something. Um, and so, you know, years ago, this, somebody came up to me and said, are you saying that I can't hope that my brother survives cancer? I'm saying, no, of course you can hope your brother survives cancer. What I'm saying is you can't stand there, if he needs to go to the hospital, you can't stand there with car keys in your hand and say, I hope you make it to the hospital. So what I'm trying to get at is I want us to separate what we have control over and what we don't have control over. And we, you know, you and I are not going to take out a dam today, but ultimately we do have control over where the dams stand because we could take them out. So for us to say we hope they come out is, is a cop-out because we could take them out. I had a very smart, um, um, Anishinaabeg woman write to me several years ago about that essay and she said so but hope does play a role right because even if you took out dams on the Klamath you would still have to hope and I loved her words she said she said that that would be your offering and your prayer to the salmon but then at that point you would have to hope that they accept your prayer and offering and that they come back and I completely agree with that what I can't do is sit on my butt and say, I hope Sam and survive and not do anything. Right. Um, but what I can do is do everything that is possible. And then, once I do that, I have to hope. So global warming, um, this is a place, and I could easily be wrong, but I, this is a place I might disagree a little bit with, with Guy, and we've talked about this a little bit. I believe that if humans disappeared tomorrow, um, or if industrial civilization is put tomorrow, that'd be good enough. Um, I think that there might be the forests and grasslands and wetlands are so good at sequestering carbon that things might settle down. And I would have a very friendly conversation with him about that. Um, and the point is that. Um, that that is a hope, because I cannot restore the grasslands there. But what's not a hope is that I can work to bring down civilization. That's what I've got to do. 
to make that hope possible, a possibility as opposed to, obviously if things continue as they are, then it's all, it's, it's toast. Um, and for many places on the planet, it's probably toast for sure. There may be some places on the planet that will still allow for life. And, if if, and, and it, if, if civilization came down right now. If, exactly. If well, and that, and that, and here's the thing, is that if there is a one one millionth of one percent chance that that possibility is real, mm -hmm. then given what's at stake, we have to do it. We have to fight for it. Yes. Um, because I, I have a, a good friend who, my environmental mentor, John Osborne, who has, um, who often says um, that we can't predict the future, and so therefore, as, as things become increasingly chaotic, he wants to make sure some doors remain open. And what we know is if this particular piece of land, if the trees on it are still standing, they may still be standing in 100 years. But if they're gone now, they're gone forever. And if the grizzly bears are gone, they're gone forever. But if they're still there in 10 years, they may still be there in 100. And why this doesn't give people some impetus to get up off their rear ends and protect long enough at this critical time some of these species? Or to give them a slightly plants, better chance. A slight, exactly. I mean, I completely agree. I, I honestly think, I honestly think where this is going to go is that, um, I was talking to a friend the other day and I said, what is your honest best hope for the planet? And she said that a few of the, um, a few bacteria survive near thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. At that point, that's her best hope. I, I actually am with her on that. Yeah. That's kind of where I'm at. And I'm basically there too. That's what I think is going to happen, but that doesn't alter the fact that right now Pacific lampreys are still alive. And as long as they're still alive, then I'll be goddamned if I'm not going to do everything to make sure that they survive for one more minute. Going out in our integrity. How can we? How can we not be doing? You know, I think these off, things for what living critters are left. And I think often about Henning von Treskow. He was one of the members of the resistance against Hitler in World War II. He was on the Eastern Front, and he had been trying. He's with a group who was trying to assassinate Hitler for years. And when D-Day came around, all the Germans, all the sane Germans, recognized the war's over, and so a lot of them wanted to call off their assassination attempts because it's like, look, it's done. So why should we risk our lives just, you know, when, when it's all over anyway? I mean, all this we'll be doing is making it so it goes down sooner. And he said, look, 10,000 or something, civilians die every day. And so every day we can stop this war sooner is 10,000 civilians not dead. And he said, besides which, I'm doing this because I want it known to the world that there were some people who didn't go along and that there were some people who were decent. And so the attempts have to go forward. And I think about that a lot and I feel the same way, that I want for the tree frogs and the Pacific wrens and the um, golden crowned kinglets, I want them to know that there were some humans who were still decent. And, um, and I want them not just to know that, but actually another part is, I want, I mean, it's not just symbolic for me and it's not just emotional, but like I said, if there's a 1% chance that my work can make any difference at all in, in terms of saving one species, then I should be working 10 times harder than I am. Um, because that, for me, that is the only measure, and I've said this forever, the only measure by which we will be judged by those who come after is going to be the health of the land base. That's all. That's all anybody's going to care about, human or non-human. Without that, there's no life. Without there's nothing. And so, um, so that's, that's where, and so in terms of that, what hope does is hope is basically, in, this, in, in the context of the larger culture, hope is basically um, just an abrogation of responsibility, and it's a way to pacify us into um, hoping that some, someone else is going to accomplish something. But hoping, oh, if they just create the right sort of solar panels, things will be okay. Or if a Democrat just gets in the White House, things will be okay. Or if, if Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein get their work done, things will be okay. Or if, if some other miracle happens, things will be okay. And that's, 
I've heard it said that, that, you know, the whole, we all know about Pandora's box and hope being left in the box and hope was the only good thing, but I got this analysis from Wes Jackson that he said that um, actually hope, hope belonged in the box with the rest of them because hope is a curse. Mm -hmm. Because what it does is it keeps you from getting up and actually doing the fucking work to get rid of the other bad things. And I would like very much to just slightly merge your closing three sentences from that article to wrap this up because they are just fabulous. Yeah. When you give up on hope, the exploiter-victim relationship is broken. When you give up on hope, you turn away from fear. When you quit relying on hope and instead begin to protect the people, things, and places you love, you become very dangerous indeed to those in power. But you certainly do support the living systems by getting out there and doing something. And my brother has taken five gallon buckets of water out of the creek, which sometimes it takes him a while to fill up because we're in drought and there's only a trickle in our creek now, and pours them on the base of this tree. And he's been doing that for six years every year to keep that bee tower alive so that we have for our whole neighborhood. Now that's one tiny example of the kind of thing that I think you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That people need to look around where they are in place and find something that is actually connected to the living world. And to do something that actually helps the land. I'm not talking about putting in a garden, because putting in a garden can be fun and it's, you know, provides food for you. But it's like, what does it do for the bees? What does it do for the, um, the chickadees? What does it do for them? You know, what, they're, they're the ones. I mean, it's great. I do, things, I do things that are for me, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's also really important. I mean, what are you doing actually that helps? And a lot of times, honestly, the best thing you can do for the land is just leave it alone. You know, it knows better. Don't scrape the leaves off. Leave the leaves laying there. They help it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's, I guess, I guess, and, and you can ask me another question if you want, but, but for me now to end, I want to end on two things that I find actually helpful. Some, the other day I did a talk by Skype with some students at James Madison University, and they start, the first question was, tell us what you think has gotten worse in the last 10 years and what's gotten better. And I was able to list a bunch of things that gotten worse. That's was, pretty easy. Yeah. And then it's like, what's gotten better? Oh. Well, the economy collapsed in 2008, that's good. And then also, finally I came up with, with two things that actually do give me optimism. One is Chernobyl. And the reason Chernobyl gives me some optimism is because, yes, I understand that the creatures there are irradiated, but the wolves are back, and the moose are back, and the beavers are back, and the place is alive. And what that says, it says a few things to me. One is that life wants to live. Life so wants to live. And if you just let it, as long as you haven't pushed it too far, I'm not saying that the earth is so resilient it can take anything. What I'm saying is that, is that it's really, really easy. Leave it the fuck alone. And another thing it says to me is that the daily workings of agriculture are more harmful than the worst industrial, or second worst industrial catastrophe, or second worst nuclear catastrophe. This planet that plants ever experienced um, through Chernobyl, that that is less bad than agriculture. And the other thing that gives me hope, and this is hope, is that there are more than 450 dead zones in the oceans, which is terrible, but there has been one that has recovered, one and only one. And the reason it recovered is because the Soviet Union collapsed. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, it made it so agriculture was no longer possible in the Black Sea right next to that dead zone. And the point is, left alone, the fish came back. And once again, I don't, I'm not in any way saying, oh, we can just let things go and the earth will survive. I'm not saying that. And I hate it when people say that. What I'm saying is, if you haven't pushed it too far, all you have to do is get out of the way. So, on that note, we encourage anyone who's listening to this to do something to preserve living beings. To preserve living beings, and the other thing, I want to give one more image Please. here, which is, which is that um, 
the image that keeps coming to me all the time is that, I mean, the, the, key, the key part of what I was just saying is leave it alone. That doesn't mean do nothing because you have to stop the original insults. Well, that's humans. And oh, yes. Did I say that? <laughs> and it's, it's like, you know, so many environmentalists, I keep picturing there's a body on a table, a live body on a table, it's bleeding out. And all these EMTs and nurses and doctors are working as hard as they can to try to patch up this body before it bleeds out. And they're not doing the most important thing of all, which is they're not stopping the person who is stabbing the body continues to stab the body as they work on it. Wow, that's an amazing little metaphor for what we're ha we have happening on the planet. So this, all this stuff I'm saying about letting things recover is only true if you're stopping the damage. And that's, that's the Chernobyl example. Humans, yeah. humans were e eliminated Ejected. from the equation. Yeah. And the living systems, the life communities, were able to gradually reclaim the space and thrive. They may be having their litters in more rapid succession, which I've read, which is partly due to the radiation, but, it, but they are actually thriving. But they're there. Again. I'd rather they're, they're there, there than not. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, gosh. Well, this has been lovely, Derek. Oh, it's been really wonderful. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you.